Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning is the Epistle Lesson, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We read these words again in the name of our Lord. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked when you followed the ways of this present world. You were following the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now at work in the people who disobey. Formerly, we all lived among them in the passions of our sinful flesh, as we carried out the desires of the sinful flesh and its thoughts. Like all the others, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. But God, because he is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. He also raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He did this so that in the coming ages, he might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. So far our text, let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are your words. We ask that you would sanctify them through it. Sanctify us through the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Christ Jesus, Dear fellow redeemed, the battery in our van is getting a little old, and this winter I noticed that it was, it was getting weak. I know that Katie noticed it too. But there were times we'd go out and we'd turn the key and it'd just get the car going. And so in the colder parts of the winter, I would actually put the charger on the battery at night just to make sure it was fully charged in the morning. I'm sure all of you that have done quite a bit of driving know that dreaded feeling of putting the key in, turning it, and nothing. Well, that, that idea of a battery needing charge and having purpose is the illustration that I want to use throughout the sermon as a picture of you and me. In our text, Paul tells us that we're made alive in Christ. That we're alive for salvation and alive for good works. So made alive by grace. Sorry, I think I misspoke before. Made alive by grace. Alive for salvation. There are some hard truths for us to grasp in this text. And, and some of them aren't real flattering about us. Notice what it says. First verse, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Most of us have this idea inside of us that we're really good people. That, yeah, we may struggle, we may be weak. We're like that battery that when you turn the key, it, it, it just gets the car moving, cranking. Okay? Not perfect. We may struggle a lot. But really, deep, deep inside, we're good. Well, notice what Paul said. He said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That means when you turn the key on your spiritual car, 
Not even the dash lights come on. There's no power within you. You are dead. Dead by nature. So people that are dead, batteries that are dead, need an external force to act upon them. Just think, if there were a corpse lying up here this morning, a dead body, what would we expect it to do? Well, nothing, because it's dead. But it's not just that it won't do anything. It can't do anything. It's dead. So it's not just that you won't do anything spiritually, nothing good. It's that you can't do anything. There is no good in you by nature. And in the book of Romans, that's exactly what Paul said. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out. So we, by nature, are dead in our trespasses and sins. We need an external force to act upon us. You know, it wouldn't matter if I went out to my battery in the van and gave it a good pep talk and said, in the morning, I want you charged up and ready to go. That battery can't charge itself. It needs an external force. And so do you. You need someone from the outside to act upon you, to give you life. And amazingly, that is exactly what God has done. He has made you alive by grace. God has acted. God has brought His grace to you. God has given you the gift of faith so that you believe God's grace. We'll speak of grace being the empty hand that that holds on to God's grace. So when we speak of God's grace here in our text, What does it mean? In that simple word, Paul in our text is summarizing everything that God did for you in Jesus. That by grace, God sent Jesus to live a perfect life in your place. To live the life that God demands to be truly good on the inside and the outside, and not just good by some human standard, but perfect. Perfect in thought, word, and deed. And by grace, Jesus lived that life for you. Then by grace, Jesus died for you. The consequence of sin is death. Physical and temporal death, so death to our body, and spiritual death. In a temporal sense, being dead spiritually by nature, and in an eternal sense, suffering in hell. The consequence of sin was taken by Jesus. When Jesus took your guilt away, what he was rescuing you from was the consequence of your sins. So he took those sins into his own body and he suffered those consequences. He suffered separation from God, agony of body and soul so that you won't have to. And Jesus did that 
not because you deserved it, but because he chose to love you. Jesus chose to demonstrate his mercy towards you. He didn't treat you as he could. He could have punished you. But instead, he took your guilt away. And now he gives you what you don't deserve. Life. You, by faith, are living. You, by faith, are alive. You're by faith God's dearly loved children. So you are alive. You have this gift of faith, and that is no small thing. Faith is a great miracle. Faith is contrary to our nature. And there are two important things that make faith so impossible. The first is that we're dead by nature. And yet faith makes us alive. You know that corpse that I mentioned lying here? If God suddenly, Jesus came here and spoke and it came to life, we'd be like, wow, what a miracle. And it would be. Each and every one of you who believe are no less of a miracle. When God brought you to faith in Jesus... He raised you from the dead. You crossed over from death to life, as Jesus said. So your faith is a miracle. You, in in that sense, are a miracle. So your faith is not an everyday common thing. It's a great, powerful act of God that he made you alive in Christ, alive by grace. Then the second point that makes faith unnatural is that our human nature tends to think along the line of good works. You may think it's an easy thing to trust that Jesus has done it all, that there's nothing you need to do. Jesus has done all the work for you so that heaven is yours. But that trust of someone else to rescue us, that's contrary to our nature. We'll even say in our society, if you want a job done properly, do it yourself. We naturally approach our salvation that way too. We want to help Jesus. There's got to be something that i got to do. Something to make me feel better. So that I can at least trust myself just a little bit. But if faith was something that we did and not just a gift from God, then it would be our works that save us. If we have to participate in the creation of faith in even just the smallest way, then it's really that small work that saves us. And if it's even the tiniest little work, then it's not by grace. Salvation is by grace alone. It is uh, apart from your good works. And that is the only way that you can be confident. Because if it relies on you in any way, you'll be wondering, have I done enough? Have I played my part? It is by grace you have been saved. Therefore, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, your sins are forgiven. You are alive. You are God's child, destined for heaven. So you're alive for salvation, alive by grace, but also alive for good works. 
batteries are always created with a purpose. They're a, a tool. I haven't been to anyone's house yet and they've just got batteries on the shelves decorating the house. Okay. Batteries are a tool for use. Okay. We want them to turn over our cars. We want them to light our flashlight, drive our phones and laptops. Okay. Batteries are a tool. They have a purpose. You are no different. You have been made alive. God has raised you from the dead spiritually with a purpose. And that purpose is brought out in our last verse, where it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. God has a very specific purpose for the life that he's given you by faith. That you would do good works. Now, I can't tell you what specific works that God has for you in your particular life. But there are some general rules that we can use to identify those works. And I would like to use some of the words in our text, words that are used to describe God's love for us as some of those marking words for the good works in our life. The first one we already talked a little bit about is mercy. That God is rich in mercy towards us. And so mercy is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we can manifest in our life. So to be merciful is to not treat someone as we could. And maybe a good example of this and a good application of it would be parents with their kids. Let's face it, sometimes kids do things that annoy and anger their parents. And a parent can be rightly justified in their anger against that child and, and maybe even want to make them feel miserable. God would have us be merciful. Our purpose as parents isn't to make our kids pay for their sins. No, we're to be merciful to them. Now, that doesn't mean that there is no discipline. But the discipline isn't a punishment, but a loving act toward them. So be merciful. You can probably think of people in your life that so easily push your buttons. Maybe it's a workmate or a boss. And you feel very justified about your anger and your feelings towards that person. God would have you be merciful. Don't treat them as you could. Give them some mercy. The second word that I'd like to pull out of the text is the word kindness. God is kind to us in Christ Jesus. Now, that, that word kindness is very much connected to the word mercy, but also to the word grace. To be kind to someone is to treat them as they don't deserve. You can be kind to the people around you. One of the reasons that that word jumped out to me in the text is through the years as a pastor, as I've tried to help married couples, I've really come to realize that one of the first steps of healing the marriage relationship is just beginning to be kind to one another again. It's true that our spouses can, can do things that hurt us deeply 
And we can be very justified in our reaction to those hurts and those wrongs. But how will you heal the relationship? Yeah, you may have to talk through those issues. But when you're not directly dealing with those issues, I would suggest a good rule of thumb. Just be kind to each other. And kindness can take such small, small demonstrations. Just bringing a snack or a drink to someone. Just asking how someone is doing, showing that you care. Kids, picking up a room without mom and dad having to ask you. That's a great act of kindness. So we can look for ways simply to be kind to the people around us. If we could work at manifesting mercy and kindness in our lives, what a great difference that would make for our human relationships. We would be drawn closer and closer to each other in love. This would be a great blessing to us. So manifest mercy and kindness. These are certainly some of the good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. The last point I want to make is I'm guilty of this. Using my sinful nature as a cop-out. Sometimes when I, I look at these specific words of God telling me to manifest good works, I'll, I'll say, well, I'll never be perfect. I'll never be who God wants me to be. Let's face it, most days I'm not even who I want to be. So I'll never be the good person that God wants. Why even try? Does God really set us goals? Does God give us encouragement to do things that He knows we can never do? I don't think so. When God caused Paul to write that you're His workmanship to do good works which He's prepared in advance, he expects us to do those things. Our sinful nature is not an excuse. We should be daily praying, Lord, show me the good works you want me to do today. Shape me into who you want me to be. Empower me to carry out those good works. So that's a challenge for you and me. To be who God wants me to be. Not for salvation. No, Jesus took care of all of that. We're saved by grace, not by works. It was His work, His life, His death, His triumphant resurrection that made us alive and saved us. But now He's saved us with purpose. He's given us life that we would live. That we would live for Him. And as He says in Matthew 5, let our light shine before men that they may see our good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. So may God charge us up May He electrify us, not only for our salvation, but so that we can shine before a dark and sinful world. May God grant us His grace and His Spirit to do so. To Him be the glory, 
now and forever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.